I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm your host, Jeremy Bergeron, the Vice President of Media Strategy at Mission.org. And this is the show where twice a week, you'll get VIP access into the hearts and minds of some of the most influential marketers in the world. On Marketing Trends, we'll do two things. We'll go deep on a human level, and we'll go even deeper on the nitty gritty of what makes for the most successful marketers and strategies today. I'm glad you're here. Now let's get into it. Coming into a new marketing role during a critical rebranding phase of a company's life is no small task to take on. There are challenges with developing new working relationships, and most importantly, trust, in order to create a smooth and successful evolution for the business. I'm naturally very curious, so I kind of like want to delve into the details on some things, and as soon as you get to a confidence level, you're like, okay, that's either great, or you know, that might be something you want to revisit. Honestly, I think some people feel like that's a little bit micromanagey. This is what makes Paul Stoddard successful in his role as chief marketing officer at Epicor. Epicor is this enterprise resource planning company. And while Paul is a relatively new leader at Epicor, he's done a tremendous amount for the brand already. Paul told us all about it on this episode of Marketing Trends, and his impact starts with the fact that his foundation is built on the idea that you should always start with the customer no matter what it takes. And even though at first blush, he admits he may come across as a bit of a micromanager, Paul's ultimate goal is to understand the way things are done in order to find efficiency in the processes and ultimately build deep trust and foster teamwork with his colleagues. We'll dive into exactly what that looks like and all the cool ways the Epicor marketing team is standing out from the competition right here. So sit back and enjoy this episode. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Marketing Trends. This is your host, Jeremy Bergeron. And today we have Paul Stoddart, CMO of Epicor, on the show today. Paul, welcome to the show. Jeremy, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Super excited to have you here. And now you're in Austin, right? I am in Austin. I'm in Austin too. We, next time we're going to have you come to the studio. We have an amazing studio here in Austin. And so if we can coordinate that in the future, we'll do a lot, like an in-person interview. And those are always fun. But I'm glad you're in the same city, man. That's awesome. And you've been in Austin for how long? Great question. I've been in Austin now um, about 18 months. So I actually joined Epicor the day that COVID really hit and everyone went into lockdown. So actually my first 18 months at Epicor, I, I really didn't get to see anyone. It's all been about Zoom and, and Teams and all of those good things. So gosh, yeah, it's like uh, I, I'm in a blank room right now. That's, that's been my life, uh, you know, whilst, whilst being here. Well, maybe the most important question of the day is what's your favorite breakfast taco in Austin? Oh, golly. Have you tried Vegan Nom? It's, it's a vegan taco place. It's over in uh, East Austin. And I got to tell you, I think it's better than anywhere. Vegan nom. Vegan nom. I love it. I love it. Well, you know you're in a great city for anything technology, food, music, like Austin has it going on. So we're glad you're here. And um, Epicor, as a company that I've kind of been, I've heard about before, um, I have friends that have interviewed Steve before, and I've kind of seen some of the, I mean, the industry is interesting. And you start looking at the ERP world, it becomes a little more sexy because there's a lot of growth happening. There's a lot of competitors in the space. And so I'm super bullish on Epicor to see kind of where you guys head. Um, but just give us some context here. You know, for you, where did the genesis start for your interest in marketing? Like, where did that start for you? Oh, wow. I mean, I, I guess, you know, right back in the day, uh, you know, you, you come out of college and you're trying to find your way in your career. And, and yeah, you know, there are people who recognize, off, you know, day one that they should be in marketing and that's their field. It wasn't mine. My background was mathematics. You know, so a perfect fit for, for marketing today. But, you know, back, back in the era, I guess, uh, you know, I just found myself as I was speaking with people, uh, really wanting to understand them and, you know, figuring out how to 
create a better experience of whatever we were doing. I, I started kind of in sales, to be honest with you. And quite naturally, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm on the wrong side of the house. It's like, I, I don't want to be selling someone. I actually want to be, you know, understanding people's needs and um, being able to, you know, really build relationships and create great experiences. And that, that's the whole discipline of marketing. So it's been a lifelong quest. Uh, yeah, I think I wrote a little thing about this on LinkedIn, a little plug there the other day. But, you know, it's like you have to keep revisiting your passion. And uh, marketing's one of those that changes so fast. You know, it keeps growing. Was there a particular marketer or entrepreneur in the early days for you that kind of lit the path or you saw an interest at like it actually being done maybe at some brand or company? Yeah, and it, it kind of sounds trite, but um, for me, it was Richard Branson. It was Virgin. You know, it was kind of like all kicking off back in the day. It was Virgin Records, Virgin Atlantic was, you know, the, the airline beating out the rest and, you know, just such a unique approach to, to business and how they thought of things. Their marketing was just completely different to everyone else's. So, you know, I kind of like book, look back and even reading his, uh, you know, autobiography and you're kind of like, this, this is a unique person with a unique perspective on branding and marketing and, you know, just, just all things really. So yeah, Virgin would be right up there. I like it. I like it. Okay. So for our listeners who are not familiar with Epicor, tell us a little bit about the company and the types of industries that you're serving. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, Epicor, like you said, is an ERP company. And uh, the way we think about it is our customers are those that make, move, and sell. So if you think of a, a company who is a manufacturer, a distributor, a reseller, then, you know, really we are that, that back end, the backbone to, you know, their operations. Um, we've been doing that for 50 years. We've got tens of thousands of customers globally. So like 30 something thousand. Steve would give you the exact number tomorrow. So uh, 30,000 customers in over 150 com uh, countries. And that's, that's what we do. You know, we're, we're right there behind them. Hmm. So if anyone Googles you, which I'm sure some people will, they'll see that you spend some time at Microsoft. You spend some time at IBM. You have a really kind of a cool background. And I'm curious about that kind of transition. Like what was it like going from, you know, a VP and partner at IBM to an Epicor? Yeah, you know, everything's an experience, right? You, you create, you, you learn along the way. Um, every role I've had, you know, a different thing to it and you draw upon it and, you know, it all builds you to, to who you are and how you act. So, you know, there were great things to, you know, IBM for sure, brilliant things at Microsoft. And, you know, I, I'd say they just, they just help you learn to be who you, who you are um, and your leadership style. And, you know, every role is different, no question about it. But I, I think it, you know, hones into you you know, what's important to you as a leader um, and what, are, you know, where are your passion areas? And, you know, every company I've been at really have like tried to play to people's strengths. Um, and again, that's a really important, you know, thing. I think that's part of my leadership style is try to focus on people's, you know, positives and really where they've got, you know, great passion areas and, you know, then just great things flourish from there. And, you know, the companies I've been at, you know, kind of foster that kind of environment. That's actually a lead into what I was going to ask you next, which was like, what what is, a big leadership lesson you, you took from Microsoft and or IBM, or th is there anything else that comes up when you think about key takeaways, leadership lessons from, you know, your time at those, those marquee brands? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's <laughs> similar uh, across the all. You know, you look for the, the thread if you like, and uh, I think each company and Epicor, it, it's about having ownership. It's about a pride of ownership and wanting to go deep, being curious. Um, you know, it's one of our leadership principles and, you know, our marketing principles here at um, Epicor, we, we set those early on um, and being curious and, you know, uh, not being the person to say no, but always be the person to find a way. You know, that, that for me was the, the pinnacle of being at Microsoft back in the day, you know, IBM, you know, I think they're, they're completely customer oriented and it's about finding the right solutions and, you know, Epicor to me, it's just the, the next level again probably to an even more degree, you know, it's like, that is the core to who Epicor are. It's like they, they live and breathe their, their customer and, you know, it's core to the value of our brand. Mm, I love that. And we're going to get into the customer experience and journey as well, because I want to, I want to hear your insight in that. So after, you know, a long career in technology with Microsoft and IBM, you're now with Epicor, you've been there a, just over a year and a half. Yeah. What was the particular position of interest for you? Like, from the outside looking in, where you like Epicor is the next step? And then also kind of a follow-up is what are some of the projects you're currently working on? Yeah. So, I mean, like, like everyone, marketing is a, you know, a discipline where I'd say it's pretty, pretty hot in the marketplace. So, you know, when you open your eyes and say, hey, I'm willing to move on from one place and consider other things, 
Honestly, there were lots of things out there, but Epicor to me kind of stood out for, for many different reasons. And I think the key one in many ways is just the challenge that you know it had in front of it. Um, and it was just a really good challenge. Uh, I think as a marketeer, you know, there's always going to be uh, good and bad and you know, challenges that you don't want to necessarily tackle. But there was a recipe at Epicor where you kind of go, wow, you know, Steve Murphy had come on board as the, the CEO, and I know you're speaking with him as well. He kind of whipped things up and was kind of like, hey, you know, we need to do things differently. There's some great in the company that we need to double down on, um, like the obsession around customers. You know, no question about that. He's you know, taken that to the next level. But you know, he's, he's kind of like reinvented from the inside out, I would say, along with the likes of Hamanchu, our, our president. Um, you know, the, the technology got completely rebuilt. So all of the elements you need, if you're, you're marketing, you want to have a great product that you can bring to market. You want to like have great people to work with. So like, it was like all of those bits of the recipe were there and you could just see it's like if, if a, you know, if for me, if I came in, I felt like I could actually really add value, bring some of the experiences I'd had, you know, both of the companies I was at, but also, you know, we were consulting to other companies. So you bring some other level of experience there as well. So unique challenge, unique people, um, you know, just at the right time where it's kind of like, you know, how could you turn it down? Hmm. So what are some of the, the things you're currently working on? Well, I mean, we've just gone through our rebrand, right? So um, I know you know that. So uh, you're right. I've been here 18 months and it was one of the first challenges. I didn't think it would be. I mean, honestly, Jeremy, I was like, I came on board. I might have glibly actually said to the ELT, hey, you know, there are many things we can do from demand gen through to, you know, um, up-leveling different things like digital. Let's not tackle brand straight away. And um, the feedback was like, let's tackle the brand straight away. <laughs> 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 so that was that was pretty interesting and you know for a cmo you're kind of like you know it's going to be the bigger motive one you know it's like everyone's got an invested interest about the whole of the organization so uh that was a pretty big undertaking to take on board straight away and uh yeah that was like really the first year um tackling that breaking it down bringing it to market um it's been a, a brilliant exercise and you know brands one of those things that it's a you know an ever-evolving journey so i'd say we're we kind of, we've done phase one and now it's about, you know, making sure that we, you know, keep reinforcing it and uh, building upon it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, it's a big, big undertaking to, you know, affect the brand, the experience that you want for your customers end to end throughout the whole of the organization. And that, that's the mission. So I'd say the, the big one really, Jeremy, is, you know, we tackled that up front, but we're, we're still, still working that journey. Got it. So as you mentioned, Epicor, you know, went through this soft launch and a brand refresh. What was the reasoning behind the brand refresh? I think it was, it was ready. I mean, I think the key, like I say, hey, the rest of the organization had been largely reset, brilliant sales organization and operations. The product was ready. Um, it's a company that's been growing organically um, through merger and acquisition uh, over 50 years. So, you know, there's a point where you're like, hey, we, we need to take a look at this and go, are we actually making it easier for our customers or, you know, are we the way that we've you know, evolved, is it, is it complicated? Um, and brand really should be something that you know, helps people, not hinders them. Uh, so it was the right time to go, okay, let's look at this. You know, how do you make a, a simplified experience, a better experience, mm. you know, and deliver on the, the promise of what the brand is? And I think the, the most telling feedback was our customers who were like, you know, um, we could go to your website, we could read about you, and, you know, we would interpret an experience that is so different to the one we have. And if, if only you kind of like portrayed yourself the way you actually, you know, behave when we're with you, you know, it's, it was night and day. Wow. So that, that was the big challenge. And that was why I was like, okay, well, we, we've got to do this now. There's, there's no point in creating the best, world's, you know, the world's best digital performance marketing organization for something that, you know, people were kind of like... It, doesn't resonate. Mm. How do you stay true to Epicor's DNA and like really stay authentic to the brand in, in a brand refresh? A lot of hard work. You know, you, you have to delve deep, right? You got to look within, you got to like to speak with your own people. But, you know, a lot of it, Jeremy, is also about truly understanding externally what people you know, say about you, because that's, that's where the, the truth is. Yeah, we, we all have our own blinkers. So we might think, hey, this is the, the DNA of, of Epicor and, you know, it's directionally correct. But then it's, you know, how does that actually get, you know, smelt and taste, test, you know, tasted by your, your customers? So, you know, it's, it's doing that research, getting into it and saying, look, 
this is what we are. These are the things that we, we would stand by and say are important. How do we now reinforce that? And what's detracting from it? And how do we stop some of those things? Um, but what are the other things that you know, we, we want to be known for, need to do, um, and introduce those at the same time? So it's, it's a process, no question. Were there any particular challenges that you've faced with rebranding? Because look, the company has been around, what, nearly 50 years or o- over 50 years at this point. Yeah. So were there like some key challenges that maybe stuck out more because the brand was you know, five decades old? Yeah, I mean, it, it's maybe a little bit inside baseball, but, you know, I, I guess there's two things. So one is we're, we're privileged. Uh, you know, our, our background is industry depth, right? We've got people who are working at this company who have been here 20, 25 years. They know the industries we serve, you know, arguably as well as the industries themselves. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of sunk cost bias, if you like, into, you know, the way we've done things or, you know, the, the way they feel comfortable with things. So there was, a, there was a little bit of a challenge there, but I would, I would actually say I was pleasantly surprised by the openness of the organization to say, hey, we've got to do what's right for the customers. So if, if it feels right to us, but wrong to them, you know, we, you know, we're the ones that have to change. Our customers shouldn't have to change because of us. Right. And then the second part is, you know, you, you're taking something through uh, M&A. The reality is you're going to have some, uh, what I would call, you know, kind of like historical uh, systems and processes, you know, even technology. And some of that stuff can be quite technically challenging because you're running different systems in different ways. And, you know, you've got to bring those things together and, and try and create something better than, you know, the some of the parts, if you like. Mm. So what, what were some of the elements that you kept in place from the previous brand? And what were some that you altered? Great question. You know, it's kind of like, it feels like, uh, I would say it was a, an evolution versus a revolution. And yet, if you spoke to any of our customers, as we recently did, uh, you know, our, our annual conference, they're like, this, this is a completely different epical. This is a revolution in, you know, how, who you are. And, you know, now it all makes sense again. You know, so what, what do you keep? Well, you keep a lot of the DNA. So like we were saying, you know, our, the values of the organization didn't change. The values, you know, they're, they're great. They're really, really strong. And, you know, our CHRO is passionate about them and, you know, put a lot of time and effort with Steve and the rest and, you know, those things stay, you know, obviously the name did, you know, you probably know that Epicor hasn't changed the name, but then really kind of like everything wholesale kind of went from there. So from visual through to the narrative, through to, you know, all of the, you know, the identity work, all of those things got, you know, really a, a refresh and it is a refresh to, to represent who we are today and also align to the business strategy moving forward because the world has just moved on, you know, crazy over the last few years and you've got to make sure your brand is pointed exactly where you are and where you want to go. Mm. So you, you did, you did a lot of things. I know one thing is you altered the logo, mm-hmm. but I don't think you announced this refresh with like a big, a big announcement. So as a mar- as a marketer and a leader, can you tell our audience like why you decided to go with a soft launch on the refresh? Yeah. And it's, it's a good way to describe it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's twofold. So the first thing to, to me, and I'm sure you know, a lot of my peers who'd be listening to this would say, you know, brand is internally focused and externally felt. So the, you know, the effort and the emphasis was really about, you know, let's, let's get it right. Let's land it well. Let's make sure, you know, hey, if we've got to, we've got to test some things, let's test some things on ourselves and make sure it resonates. It's not just like go out there with a fanfare and someone point out something that was, you know, going to be wrong. So really, but taking that approach and taking ownership and trying to make sure that the whole organization felt that it was theirs to own and actually bring to market versus it's an advertising page. This is, you know, this is just a, you know, a veneer. It's not a veneer. The brand is the core of who we are and how we operate. You know, it was a bit of a conscious decision. We, we definitely talked about it as an ELT when we were like, look, you know, we don't want people to mistake this as just, uh, you know, a campaign or advertising. This, this is who we are. Um, and there are some things that we are fundamentally changing to, you know, better our customers. And therefore, you know, everyone has to own it. So that, that's why it was an internally focused, externally felt. And, uh, you know, there's nothing better than word of mouth. There's nothing better than people recognizing, you know, the work. And you know, we're seeing some awards coming through now. We're like, you know, that, that speaks for itself. Um, I didn't need to scream about it. The, the work screams for itself. Mm, that's awesome. So you're a year and a half into the job. Yeah. I'd like you to reflect on, like, what's been your best day in that year and a half? And I would also like you to talk about what's been the worst day or what's been the toughest day. Golly, um, the best day, you know, I, I think we have got 
Yeah, I could phrase this differently. You could say what's been the best work and the worst work in some ways. You know, I think we've got a really amazing creative team um, and they, they do some just incredible work and they, they certainly build things in a way that, you know, there's longevity to it. So it's a building block to everything else you do. So I think the way we've introduced, you know, our brand and our messaging to market and really work to simplify our messaging, you know, less is more. You know, it, it probably isn't, you know, what people would expect because we do incredible events. I mean, world-class events. You know, we really do really smart marketing. But I'm, I'm proud as the best day is actually when you, you reduce something down and make it simpler and better, both, you know, either for an employee or for, you know, our, our customers. And there's been lots of rationalization. You know, we, we went from a website with 30,000 pages. I think that's right. Or it was a lot. Um, you know, down to a a very small percentage of that is hundreds of pages. You know, you, you wouldn't need a level of depth of content, but the reality is like, it's about a simplified, you know, better experience, getting people to what they need to, to make the decision they need to make. So they're, they're the best days. They're the good days when you know you're, you're delivering a good experience for people. The bad day, God, I guess um, it was the gift and the curse of the first day. I got to tell you, Jeremy, you know, it's like literally the, the office is shut for COVID and they were like, you know, Welcome to Ethical, you can't physically meet anyone. And that, you know, that was kind of, honestly, that was, that was challenging. It's a, it's a whole new world out there. But testament to, you know, the, the, the people, they, they reach out and they extend, you know, and, you know, you build relationships quickly. But, uh, you know, you want to come in as, a, you know, any role and feel like, you know, you can be with the people and absorb, you know, and that, that, was, that was harder for sure. Mm, I get that. I get that. You know, you talked about simplicity, you know, and it seems like, you know, as I'm a consummate student of studying businesses across industries at scale, like I want to know what scales a business from six to seven figures, seven to eight, eight to nine. What are the things in place in those kind of core functions? And it looks like that the businesses that keep that lens of simplicity are the ones that can really scale fast. And so from your perspective, you know, leading marketing at the helm there, you know, how important is simplicity when you think about marketing in general, all the way down to like tactical things, but also kind of high level strategic things? Is that a lens that you try to keep in the forefront? There's so much MarTech out there. There's so much innovation. You could be talking AI and machine learning and all kinds of things. But how much does simplicity play into the success of the marketing org that you're leading? Yeah, it is completely vital. And, you know, it's, it's a hard one because there is a level of complexity to everything you do. You know, as soon as you start getting into messaging frameworks and we look after multiple industries, you know, we've got five core industries, but under, our, under like, you know, under manufacturing, there's 20 something, you know, speciality industries. So it's, it's not a simple exercise at all. But the reality, I do believe that, you know, when things simple, simple is hard, but when you do it right, then it becomes, you know, absolutely fantastic. And, you know, a phrase I kind of like work with a lot with our, you know, our marketing department is, you know, the last best experience anywhere is the one you expect everywhere. So the one anywhere is the one everywhere. And, you know, the ones we tend to remember are the ones that were just like categorically geniusly simple. You're like, that was just so refreshingly well done. So, yeah, there, there is definitely an element of that to everything we, we do. And, you know, you don't crack it every time, but you're, you're absolutely right. It's things like the technology, it's really easy to, you know, chase the, the shiny object. Sure. And the reality is, you know, the, to do the fundamentals really well, we talk about rocking the fundamentals, rock those really well, you know, then, then you can get into the exciting stuff. Is that some things that you felt like you cultivated back in the Microsoft days and the IBM days as well? Or is that more now as a, a marketing leader at this stage where that stuff becomes more apparent? I think they're life lessons. I, I've got to be honest with you. I, I think um, any of us have been in organizations where you overly complicate things and in others where, you know, it's tragically overly simplified and you, you do, just don't do a, a good enough job as a result. So hmm. it, it's a balancing act. It definitely is a balancing act. Got it. And I, I think I've seen great examples at both ends of the spectrum in every organization. What are you learning about now? Like, what are you, uh, marketing or maybe something that's, like aligned to that, but what, are there any new things that you're actually keen on right now? It sounds um, a little bit silly. I'm still a student of brand. I wouldn't say brand is, you know, is my, my background. Um, I certainly have other people in my life who, you know, brand is the core of what, what they do. And um, actually my, my wife is a fairly 
significant marketeer and, and brand expert. So, uh, you know, I, I get schooled, you know, quite regularly in that respect. <laughs> But, you know, hey, the, the only way to get better is to, to learn. So, you know, I, I love things like Scott Galloway from NYU and, you know, his thoughts on, you know, brand strategy and, and those, you know, it, it's great. And uh, I love finding, you know, mechanisms to, you know, explain things in ways that really resonate with people because it's complex. Mm. You know, doing brand well is, isn't easy. It's really hard. You know, there's definitely a process to it. And, you, you know, the more you can, like, delve into it and find the bits that, you know, work, work for your organization and, uh, ways to describe it so everybody understands it's not i think part of the challenge certainly as you go through brand work from my perspective is bringing the whole organization along you know to do that they've kind of got to understand some of the you know the methodology so uh you know i've definitely i've, I've enjoyed you know like, like finding those different ways to explain things to people where they go okay now i understand why we're doing this you know and not just mm. not just participating but actually i feel like i'm, I'm really involved in it wow so I, I wonder how kind of how you frame Epicor's competition now. How do you think about your differentiation and competitive advantage in a pretty big space? Like there's a lot of ERP providers in that space. Mm. There's so many direct competitors. There could be some indirect competitors. So could you speak a little about how you see competition and how you differentiate in this pretty large space you're in? Yeah, I mean, this is a great example of, uh, I think there's a really good framework to work through this, and I wish I had a visual, but, you know, if you kind of thought of a, a Venn diagram, and you, you put in one bubble your, your customer, you put in one your competitor, and the, the third would be yourself, and then you're really looking for, you know, where those overlapping segments are, and it's a case of, hey, there's, there's things that your competitors are going to do that your customers want, and that, that really is their differentiation. And there's things that your competitors do and we do, and you know that's parity. And you've got to be able to talk about that well, because ultimately, otherwise, if you don't talk about it well, you know you're, you're going to get schooled by your competitors. But there are those things which you know is the the segment between you and your your customer, and they completely set you apart. I think it's a really valuable exercise for for any anyone to do. It's kind of interesting when you you go through it because you're like, wow, now I know what I've got to position, maybe what I've got a deep position. But also I know what they're gonna, you know, what others could be saying as well. And for us, I mean, honestly, it came down to two things. It was uh, relatively simple and a, a real aha moment. And yet so reinforced by our customers were like, well, yeah, hello. Um, and that was, you know, our industry specificity is like second to none. I mean, we we absolutely, you know, we look after a core set of industries and we go, you know, just just so, so, so deep. And it's easy, it's very easy to hand wave and others to say, oh, yeah, we, you know, we uh, look after manufacturing as well, but just, just to a different degree. Mm. So, you know, we've got, if a customer like really wants someone who's a, an industry expert in that area, wants an ERP that has probably been built with them in mind, you know, that, that, that's us. But the second part of it is the what and the how, right? It's the, the way we deliver it. So we actually, you know, deliver the vast majority of the work we do with our customers hand in hand. And it's a core premise. It's, it's kind of our promise as a brand. It's not kind of, it is our promise as our brand of made with you for you. So, you know, we work with our customers. We have what we call cabs, the customer advisory boards. They tell us what is needed and we build it into the roadmap. And then, you know, we test it with them and that's what gets brought to market. So, yeah, it's, it's the what and the how, you know, but I think you could plot that out pretty clearly on the, the Venn diagram and like I said, I used to do that as a consultant with, uh, you know, customers. Like, hey, let's, let's really work out what your value prop is. And I think it's a pretty cool tool. Wow. What have you learned about human behavior? Certainly in kind of getting into this industry. Now you're deep in the game in a few categories and segments. But what have you learned about human behavior? Oh, we, we, we love to be pendulums, right? We all hate change. We all absolutely hate change, but we all crave it like mad. And it's like, it must be like a light switch. The moment we go, okay, you know, we're going to do something, then they, they go all in. So that's, that's a pretty interesting, you know, you've got to take people through, through change. Um, but, you know, once they get there, it's amazing how fast, you know, you, you want to, you know, take what's coming. Mm. So I think we all know that. But uh, it's, it's certainly been an interesting uh, paradigm just watching. I, I think actually, candidly, I think COVID's accelerated some of those things. Sure. Things that we've all been persistently resistant to, you know, be willing to, you know, maybe try or accept we've, we've all been thrown into a, you've got to do things differently. So uh, it's opening people's aperture, I think. Hmm. How do you go about building a team, right? When you, when you joined Epicor, did you, were you also part of building your own team or did you kind of, was it, 
there was a team already there and you kind of assume some of those folks brought new folks in. If that's the case, I want to know kind of how you think about building a marketing team. And then also like, what are the, like the established priorities in the short and the mid and the long term? When you come in, like you're coming in, there's a bit, there's a brand refresh going on. You know, you're, the pressure can be high for the CMO role. It's like the shortest tenured role in a brand, right? It's like, you really got to deliver. And so I want to kind of hear your thinking around how you build marketing teams, how you maybe supported that at Epicor, and then like how you establish the priorities in like the short, mid and long. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, um, it's a bit of a complicated one. So uh, I think again, COVID for us kind of like changed the, the paradigm. So the reality is we're a B2B um, organization. There's lots of tried and tested traditional ways to, you know, obviously go to market events being a, a really key one. So with COVID, you know, there, there was things that were thrown into chaos of, hey, look, we, we can't do the things that we have traditionally always done. So we need to do some things differently. Honestly, that, that was probably really good um, for me coming in because it meant, hey, whereas you might be coming in and wanting to test some things and, you know, maybe, you know, there'd be some, you know, sacred things that people didn't want, you know, to, to play with. Everything became viable all of a sudden. So, you know, there, there was an element of that. Um, but I, I did inherit a team. Um, I inherited a, a, a large team and a, a fairly well-performing team. I, I wouldn't say that that wasn't the concern. It was just a, have we kept pace with what has to be done um, these days in market? Or is there a, a better, a different way to be doing things? Uh, have we kept pace, you know, as an organization that has grown? And we've been on like a, it feels like an exponential growth trajectory over the last few years. So, you know, obviously everything you've always done isn't going to be, be perfectly suited. And I also had a unique situation, Jeremy, in the sense of there was a gap between me and the prior CMO. So it was about, I think about six months. So the marketing organization had actually been reporting into the CEO, into Steve. And Steve's, Steve's great. You know, he's one of those guys who like really allows people to have autonomy you know, would encourage people not to, to break things unnecessarily. So, you know, the, the team was very much, hey, we're, we're going to keep things steady. You know, we're not going to break things. We're not going to try things. And then, you know, as I came on board, it was like, okay, now let's, let's relook. So, you know, what's Paul's approach? Well, Paul's approach is kind of like to seek to understand. I'm naturally very curious. So I kind of like want to, you know, delve into the details on some things. And, you know, as soon as you get to a confidence level, you're like, okay, that's either great or, you know, that might be something we want to revisit. And, uh, you know, honestly, I think some people feel like that's a little bit micromanagey. You know, when you first come in, it's like, oh, golly, this person wants to know, you know, right down to the tactic detail. And it's like, well, best to understand before you make decisions. And, you know, and then you build from there. And, and for me, it's a case of, you know, setting a, an underlying set of principles that we will adhere to. You know, hey, we want to be curious. We want to collaborate. Uh, we actually want to be practitioners. It's like, I don't mind copywriting. I, you know, actually really enjoy getting into, you know, going through the creative process, et cetera. So, you know, I encourage everyone at all levels to do that. I think leadership comes from all levels. So I encourage everybody to be like, you know, managing together. So that's, that's really the essence, if you like, of then building the team is a, you know, who's docking into that way of thinking versus not. And naturally some people opt out, but then, you know, every person you bring on board, who's kind of like, you know, you're obviously hiring for those sorts of, attributes, you know, it, it feels like that just accelerates the mission. Can you talk about the relationship between you and the CEO, Steve Murphy? Like you, he's incredibly sharp, brilliant mind. And I've heard him on other interviews, as I mentioned, it's clear that his vision for the brand is super important. And the guy's got, he's got the thing, like I call it, it's like the it factor, you know? And so folks like you and Steve, you know, I'm curious about the partnership and the collaboration there, um, especially with like you said, a lot of acquisitions, a lot of growth. There's a lot of things happening. So what's that relationship like? How did you know that, okay, this was going to be a good partnership? Because it's so key that the CEO, CMO collab partnership. Yeah, I think yeah, you kind of nailed it in the last part, which was a, I think Steve wanted to, you know, have a, a partnership. It was, uh, you know, he, he is invested. Um, he is, you're absolutely right. He's, you know, smart as a whip. He really is. You know, he always has the right question. You know, he normally has three really pressure questions and, you know, you, you better be able to, to answer them or, you know, he, he's smart. There's no question about it. 
Yeah, but the, the reality is he's also insightful. And I think he asks the right questions to help push things forward. He's not asking for the sake of asking. Mm -hmm. Rarely have I been in a meeting with in fact, I couldn't think of a meeting where, you know, Steve hasn't added value by, you know, whatever he's he said. And I've been in plenty of meetings with other, you know, C-suite in other organizations where you walk out going, I, I'm really not sure what, you know, that, that happened there. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you never find that with a Steve. And, uh, you know, you're right. He's, he's invested in the brand, in the partnership. And at the same time, and I think this is why I was like, okay, this is someone who I want to work with. He believes in autonomy. He believes, you know, you know, everyone is experts in their own discipline, but we're very aligned on the thinking of, you know, we should all be practitioners. It's like, you know, you're not hiring a figurehead of marketing. You, this is going to be someone who's going to like get in there and do the work. And, uh, you know, I was hands-on in the brand work, you know, hands-on and, you know, probably too many things, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the DNA of Epicor and across the whole ELT it's, it's actually not just Steve, you know, the, the whole team all want to be invested in each other and actually being part of the work. Mm. So you're still finding now, even now there's uh, this balance of kind of getting into the tactical. And then you said they're like a practitioner and, and also of course, being the visionary and having the kind of the goalpost ahead. And do you find that at scale, that's more difficult to do to kind of still hate, keep the practitioner hat on when your leadership, the vision kind of where the guy who needs to be the one, Hey, we're going this way. Does that kind of fade a bit when you have to get more practitioner? Are you able to, you know, cause to me, as you get bigger and bigger, what does that balance look like from practitioner to, to strategic and visionary? Yeah, it, it would be unfair of me to say I, I'm like down in the, you know, that level of uh, the work that the, the team are like knocking out every day. But yeah, I think uh -huh. the, the essence is you're willing to do so. And, uh, you know, if someone brings something to you is like, hey, you know, what do you think of this? We've got two or three options. It's like, you know, hey, you know, you can give some input. It doesn't, you don't have to be the decision maker. You can just be like, hey, here's a perspective or let's ask the right questions to make sure you're solving for the, you know, the, the mm. right problems. Yeah. Um, so that's the practitioner element, you know, there in many ways is, you know, being someone who come with just a, a little bit of a different perspective to ask, you know, different questions. Sure. Yeah. We, we just got great experts across, across the different disciplines. Yeah. They, they don't need me involved, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be if they need it. Yeah. That's awesome. What would you tell other CMOs and, and marketing leaders about, how do they really start on kind of this journey of creating a more seamless, better end-to-end -end customer experience? Like where should they start? I'm sure, it, you know, I, I'm not sure I would tell them. I, I guess I would ask, you know, where, where do they think they need to start? But for me, it's always with the customer. I mean, honestly, and, you know, hey, I, I was in a consultancy which was around, you know, user experience. So the, the reality is, you know, that deep immersion of understanding what their challenge is, what their problems are, you know, and, and what, how you're going to participate in, you know, uh, making their lives better. That's key and critical. And then you can work backwards and be like, okay, now all of the ways that we interact with the, you know, our, our customers, you know, how do we do that in the best possible way that actually is true to, you know, whatever your brand is. Mm. Work backwards from, you know, the, the most critical part of the chain. And that, that's your customer. It's like, that seems like a pretty, pretty good place to start. It hasn't, hasn't failed me yet. Mm. Back to the, the fundamental components, I think you can't get away from that part, which is, you know, the customer. So when you're thinking about, you know, mapping the customer journey across kind of these core categories that you serve, automotive, building supply, distribution, manufacturing, retail, is it a vastly different customer journey across the board at Epicor or is it pretty similar? From a marketing perspective, it's, it's probably fairly similar. Okay. You know, it, it's probably, you know, a pretty, so it's 80, 20. Okay. Yeah. The, the mechanisms are largely the same, but then, you know, Hey, the language is really different from retail than it is in, in, you know, maybe automotive or manufacturing. Um, so there's a degree of making sure that you've got scalable processes and, you know, mechanisms, you know, that, that should all be the same. And, and candidly, that's how you get a, a true brand experience, right? People should know what to expect. And, and Jeremy, our, our customers in many ways, their worlds are, are blending. Um, you know, you might have been a distributor 18 months ago, but you're probably a distributor that's done a little bit of manufacturing now, or you're a manufacturer that's actually had to like dip into distribution. Um, and maybe you've actually created some, you know, retail capability as well, because, hey, the world we live in, you know, that's, that's all game. So our industries are, are blurring and blending in that respect. So, you yeah, know, that, 
that common experience is really important. The mechanisms we have, how we engage with people in a consistent way is super important. But, you know, yeah, the fit and finish, making sure that, you know, the language makes sense and, you know, you're, you're solving the right problems for the right people. That, that's, that's critical and key. Mm. Something I saw in Deloitte had a CMO, they do a CMO study, a survey, and something I saw in the past year uh, and change was that there's been this significant decrease in the confidence across the CMO world. We just, I don't think we talk about confidence enough in the CMO role. And obviously, if you're not confident, you're not going to take chances. You're not going to be bold. You're not going to be yourself. And so you can be second guessing and there can be trailheads you go down. So it's really, really important as leaders to ensure that, you know, our people do have our trust and our confidence and, and having the tough conversations and, you know, especially when it's not there. So how do you build that? Like, how do you help them build it? I just don't think we explore that enough. That's a great question. I mean, again, I think unfortunately it goes back to your question about, you know, the CEO and the rest of the, the C suite, really. You know, we're we're built here, which is that we're here to support each other. No one's trying to like knock each other down. I'd say my closest allies, you know, the people I work with every day are, you know, our CHRO, who's, you know, absolutely stunningly brilliant, and our, our sales lead. And and actually, um, Normally, people would say where the rub happens in organizations between sales and marketing. And that's just not the, the case here. So if you're invested in each other, if you're actually like shooting towards the same goals, then, you know, frankly, for me, it, it becomes fairly easy. But that's the environment Steve's created is, you know, we're, we're here to support each other. We're not, not here to like knock each other down. So confidence comes from the fact that, you know, Steve trusts. Um, you know, and he leads by example. It's kind of like, hey, I expect you to, you know, you're all adults. I hired you as adults, behave like adults. So yeah, I, I guess a lot of it comes down to, you know, if we we behave in a way that we're we're working together, then life's gonna be good. And again, and I, I'm not tying everything back to our brand work, our brand strategy follows our business strategy. So the reality is, you know, I don't feel like any pressure in the organization that we're doing the wrong things because it's 100% aligned to the, the same you know, goals that the sales team and the HR team and our professional services team are all shooting towards. You know, and we're all, we're all in service to deliver to the customer. Mm, I like that. I, and I love how you tied it back to support, right? And like trusting and supporting each other, certainly across the ELT. And then you know, top down, bottoms up, it's like we're supporting each other. And I think that's really key, which of course will breed confidence and trust. And so that's key. You talked about the kind of sales and marketing, you know, alignment or sometimes lack thereof across. That's a big topic across, you know, the marketing and sales world. Now we're entering into this space that's, you know, there's so much business intelligence available. There's so much data. And I've talked to some CMOs on this show and I host another show where I, I talk to other folks like Steve and, and others. And, and it's interesting to hear kind of their views on kind of the sales and marketing alignment. And I'm curious just, I guess, commenting on Epicor and what are some of the things you're doing to, to keep that alignment really tight and clear across two really important parts of the org um, where historically it's like they hate each other, they love to hate, they hate to love, you know, and you know that very well. How do you kind of navigate that? I just, I don't have a great answer here. It's, it's terrible. I mean, the reality, it's a relationship, right? It, you know, if you invest in each other, our, our sales leads Lisa Pope, she's wonderful. and. Um, you know, we, we speak every week. She'll pick up the phone when she, you know, needs something. I'll call her if I want to like, you know, test something. And, you know, we don't make decisions in vacuums. It's, uh, you know, it's a, we're invested in each other. And the good thing is there's a respect to push each other as well. It's like, you know, hey, Lisa will come and be like, kind of feels like we could be doing more here. And it's like, you know, you're probably right. And in other terms, I'll be kind of like, hey, it feels like we did a great campaign, but, you know, no one's, no one's like following that through with the same message with the customer. Okay, you know, what, what do we need to do to you know, create that, that experience end to end? Mm. But there, there's just a very aligned vision, I think, which is a, you know, we're, we're about having brilliant relationships with customers. We're not, this isn't about transactions. This is about long, long relationships for us. Um, and therefore there has to be a continuity of experience and message, whether that be, the first time we touch someone, you know, from whatever channel, doesn't really matter. From when they come to the website, speaking with the, you know, the business development team that actually sits under me, that's probably unique um, to some organizations, mm. but is a great conduit 
of marketing through business development over to sales. Wow. Yeah, you know, they're, they're great truth. They're great truth tellers. Um, so they they push. Mm. They definitely uh, hold people accountable on both sides as well. So that would be a top tip for any organization. Um, I I would definitely replicate that again anywhere I went. I like that. So biz dev sits under under you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it. Just a follow up to that though. Are there technology plays that exist now? Is there business intelligence that you have access to now that also cultivates a really tight alignment and trust with sales? Completely. I mean, the, the core platforms of your business and we're, you know, shouldn't do an advert for, for anyone, but, you know, we, we're, a, you know, a big Salesforce organization and, you know, that, you know, is an, an ever growing, brilliant technology, you know, that's getting stronger and stronger in the marketing space and obviously is, you know, right, right there from a sales perspective. So. Yeah, that you ubiquitous of um, you know experience and the data flow and being able to you know, all all look at one version of the truth. That that's also like absolutely critical, right? We're not you know no one can manipulate a number. If it gets manipulated somewhere, um, it's a bit like a blockchain. All of a sudden, everyone you know starts <laughs> finding out that, that something went wrong. So um, yeah, the, the the commonality of platforms being being key, I think, to make sure that we're. You know, you don't get that some of those rubs in other organizations where you'd be looking at different data in different ways. Got it. What's the campaign or initiative that you worked on, like in your entire career, that you're most proud of? Look, I'm really, really proud of actually what we're doing at Epicor. I, I have to say, um, internally, we call the the, the campaign uh, the Know How to Know How. It's really about us putting our customers front and center and showing that you know they. We're enabling them to, you know, do what they they do. They're front and center, and we're we're kind of like largely behind the scenes. And uh, we've got the know how. They've got the know how. You put it together. It's know how to know how. It's it's a beautifully constructed, uh, you know, mechanism. Uh, very extensible. Works really brilliantly across different industries. And you know, you got to feel proud when actually you're you're singing the praises of the the people who you're you know really trying to you know have the relationship with. So. You know, it, it's fresh in mind, but I, I just think it's a it's a brilliant execution, and it's only going to get better. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it really is. The the more customers that are you know embedded in it, it, it just gets stronger and stronger. And you know, we've got brilliant customers. When you look at our portfolio of customers, it's like we've got cherished cherished brands. Uh, it's it's almost an embarrassment of riches. Wow. So that that storytelling capability is just um, it's it's a genius platform, and I'm really proud of the team for doing it. Mm, I love that. On the live event kind of event space, which it sounds like that's been a key piece. You know, mm-hmm. We've spoken to a lot of CMOs too that where they've had to really kind of pivot, of course, when it comes to live events. How are you folks at Epicor, you know, entering into this next 12 months, looking at events and what's some of the shifts and changes that you're doing? Yeah, probably like everyone else, um, you know, we're, you know, being very, very sensitive to it and, you know, thinking to, you know, every eventuality. So, uh, you know, it's kind of as you plan for the best, um, you know, and or, or hope for the best, plan for the worst, and, and every mm-hmm. every you know permutation in between. So you know, there there are events out there you want. You know, we we all hope come back. You know, everyone wants to be back with customers. Sure. And you know, we we've been lucky. We did have a customer event recently. Uh, you know, it was very controlled, um, very well done. We've got an awesome. We've got an exceptional events team. And you know they they definitely took every possible precaution and some. I love it. Um, you know we we obviously follow all, all the guidelines and all of that good stuff. Sure. But you know I I would say customers are are really they're wanting to be back. They they want to be back. You know having those face to face conversations. Mm. So you know it's a plan for those, but know that you you might have to switch to you know uh, you know a virtual event in a in a heartbeat so you've got to have the platforms in place to do so and sure that was a big investment for us you know 18 months ago is like really hadn't invested in that type of platform and we had to and you know you have to learn it and kudos to like a, an event team who are like world class at doing in person events all of a sudden became world class at doing virtual and hybrid and you know that's that's no small task that's awesome i love that in terms of content and storytelling especially, you know, your customers, what are some of the things that you're keen on thinking about content and telling stories and what are you doing to kind of flex that? Yeah. So, I mean, it is following the the narrative, I would say is, you know, we've got a strong brand narrative that we, we believe in, which is about the making with you for you, that we are there for the essential businesses, you know, we're the essential partner to the world, most essential businesses. So, you know, 
being able to you know tell that story um you know from the customer lens uh, this is you know this was their challenge this is what you know we we do together and these are the results and they they really range in the spectrum you know we we support you know two uh formula one racing teams um you know who you know during covid pivoted to be creating ventilators um you know i you know just like just did that because that's what they needed to do and you know we're right there with them all the way through to you know like i say the manufacturers distributors automotive all, all of that good stuff so you know I, I love it when we can get into a you know telling the, the meaningful story that you know explains really why we're doing this that's when it becomes magic and great and then you find the right you know medium to do so whether that be you know video or sometimes there's nothing like just a, a great long story to read um so you know, you, you, you pick the right one for the, the right customer and they're the ones I love. Mm, awesome. So thinking about like, you know, of course, the name of the show is marketing trends, right? So, you know, what are some particular trends that you're excited about either in your, your space or otherwise, or what are some of the things you're thinking of? I did see Epicor bringing AI into some things as well. So just curious of like, what are some of the next things you're thinking about or currently thinking about in terms of kind of innovation and trends? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really excited about Martech. The reality is, you know, I guess my my days at IBM were really working with customers um, and trying to figure out, you know, what was the right technology to support their business needs. And you know, what a wonderful and lucky world we're in, where you know people are applying this incredible technology to you know our discipline of marketing. Um, you know, and it, it just ranges right from. I don't know, Salesforce and Adobe through to, you know, like really niche players who are, you know, allowing you to create incredible video content in, in ways which are you know, really brand specific and anyone can do it. And it's just, you know, the, the technology that enables us to do our jobs is, is awesome. The emphasis that's going into uh, data and being able to like really get to the, the crux of, you know, what are the challenge we're solving for. And I think actually, enabling us to, you know, work really well as a holistic organization, like I said, you know, a platform that allows you to have one version of the truth so that people are pulling together versus, you know, arguing over things that you shouldn't be arguing over. That's all goodness. So, you know, I'm definitely about how do we use technology to speed things up, speed decision making, if you like, um, create higher quality, um, you know, less is more, less content, but higher quality content. Um, yeah, that, that's all part of the game for me. So uh, I, I'm really excited about all of that. Mm. Um, AI, of course, you know, wow, anything that can help us, you know, predict and help people make better decisions is brilliant. And if I were to really go into the abstract, um, and maybe we're a, a generation away from this, I think the, the future is blockchain. And I, I have to tell you, when I think about the end-to-end -end capability of like really, truly understanding every step of, you know, an experience someone has and the relationship um, and who interacted where and when and how, um, and how budgets really are applied, you know, imagine a, a blockchain media world, that would be a, a really interesting proposition. So I, I think the future is going there. Um, it will be really exciting. And, uh, you know, blockchain and AI as a combination to me, will probably be the paradigm shift that, you know, the internet was. We just haven't yet been able to realize what it is. Mm. Speaking of that, we had the CMO of um, Chainlink Labs, uh, Adeline Zhu, on earlier this week. And exceptional to see some of the things they're doing with hybrid smart contracts and smart contracts. And yep. I agree with you. Very bullish on that. And I think it's the, I think it's the, the wave of the future. There's no doubt. Who would you like to hear on the Marketing Trends podcast, Paul? I'm assuming you're, you're going to get Sir Richard Branson for me, right? Because I am a... When you said, yeah, when you said his name, I was like, yep, we'll get Richard. Okay, he's one of them. That wouldn't be bad. Um, you know, I can hear he's a little bit busy these days. Um, yeah, you know, traveling to space and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> I really valued working with Chris Capicella at Microsoft. Um, I think he, you know, he's a unique person with, you know, unique perspectives, had you know, a really long, varied career at Microsoft and uh, is probably a, a different CMO than the most. You know, so uh, I I always cherish the ability to you know hear hear from like a, a Chris. That that's always good. His name has come up already for sure. We had we had the CMO of uh, Live Person on Amber Armstrong, amazing CMO uh, who's also in Austin, by the way. So if if you don't know her, I'd love to connect you. She's amazing. Uh, but his name has come up, so he's on the list. Yeah, who else? 
you know, I think there's some technologies out there right now, which are like really, really interesting and speaking to their CMOs. So, um, uh, I don't know if you use Canva. I think Canva's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Again, mm-hmm. super helpful for driving, you know, brand consistency. So their CMO, I think, would be like fascinating. Such a growth business, such an interesting yes. business. Yes. Yeah, you know, that would be fantastic. They're definitely revolutionizing, you know, how you think about creative. So uh, not only are they they got a great marketing challenge, but you know, they are they're redefining marketing. So yeah, hey, why why not the CMO of Canva? That would be fun. I love it. Zach, his name is Zach Kitchkey. Uh, he's also based in uh, Australia, Sydney, Sydney, New South Wales. So we could definitely invite him on if he hasn't already been on, but that's a good one. Great. This has been exceptional. I appreciate you taking the time, Paul. Of course. You know, we, we get the, have the honor of, you know, connecting with all kinds of executives. And it's, it's really, it's incredible to hear these different perspectives. And, you know, someone of your background and someone like of your really interesting experience kind of coming into Epicor has been truly engaging and, and exciting. So... You're definitely the right person for the role there. And I'm excited to see what happens in the future. I'm honored. I know our audience will be excited to hear this one. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, bless you. We, we, we really appreciate it. It's great to speak to you. Fantastic. Fantastic.